We're here to introduce um, President Santos, whom we do not know as President Santos. We know him as Juan Manuel. That's who, that's who he was. He's Juan Manuel. And we knew we met Juan Manuel not as a statesman, um, certainly not as a Nobel Prize winner, but as a journalist. Um, uh, Juan Manuel's um, uh, family uh, owned and, and operated and worked at uh, the best newspaper in Colombia, El Tiempo. Um, and this was um, during the time of the drug wars in Colombia. And um, uh, the, it is difficult um, uh, to, to remember uh, and to really to imagine the bravery um, that it took to, um, uh, to do what Juan Manuel and his family did in those years. Um, uh, I remember right after my name and year, I became the post correspondent in South America. Um, and um, I had a secret weapon in, in Colombia, which is Juan <laughs> Manuel. Uh, Rosenthal had, this, had the same um, secret weapon. I remember my first trip to Colombia, I knew nothing. I could barely speak pidgin Spanish. I, I, I knew nothing. I'd drop in and see Juan Manuel. And he's like, don't worry. Um, and he organized a meeting of like um, all these sort of up and coming future leaders of Colombia. Uh, and we all went out to this, this ranch outside of Bogota and um, he, he arranged this whole thing and then sat down and just off the record, they explained Colombia to me. And I think there was a, I know there was a future defense minister there, there's a future mayor of, of, um, of uh, Bogota, a future uh, uh, Colombian ambassador to the U.S. The U.S. ambassador to Colombia was there too, and of course the future president of Colombia was there. So I got a I got a wonderful sort of um, uh, uh, education on Colombia, and in other trips I got a different kind of education in Colombia. I remember being in Bogota when the newspaper El Espectador, the competitor, was blown up, <laughs> or, or an attempt was made to to blow up the newspaper, a car bomb. Um, right in front of the um, of the paper, um, that was the kind of daily risk um, that uh, that his family undertook. His family was shocked and dismayed when he became a turncoat and went into politics instead of uh, instead of journalism. Um, but that worked out okay, uh, and um, they 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 finally came around. I think when he became vice president, they said, "Well, okay, Juan Manuel, it's okay." Uh, and uh, of course, when he became president, um, uh, but his his his, I think his approach um, uh, in the great accomplishment of of the the peace agreement in Colombia, I always thought that Juan Manuel approached it with journalistic values and um, uh, and an almost journalistic uh, method, which w which involved sort of fact finding. Um, and dealing with the reality on the ground as it was rather than the reality uh, as one's ideology or one's beliefs uh, wanted to make it. Um, so uh, I, I really think journalism was responsible for your, your Nobel Prize. Well, Nobel Prize. <laughs> Well, and, uh, and, and I think that, uh, that Harvard and Neiman w was also very, very important in that. And I am sure that in the, in the conversation uh, that, that we're going to listen now, uh, this will, will come up. And I, I also want to, to introduce Mar Margarita. She is not from the best Neiman class ever, but, the but she's best. the second best. <laughs> And, uh, and, and as, you, as you know, she has, has had a tremendous access to all this ne negotiation process, the, the mission impossible that, that Juan, Juan Manuel made possible of ending the, the longest uh, uh, armed, armed conf conflict in our hemisphere. You know, this, this was really some, something that you have to be very brave, very uh, uh, risk taker to to uh, start a negotiation like, like that in Colombia, a very divided country, after thousands and thousands of, of deaths be becoming the normal. 
and and uh, it, it has uh, it has to take a lot of courage for someone uh, from the presidency of Colombia taking this kind of risk, and and I I, I commend Juan Manuel for that. So I'm just gonna jump in with uh, the, all this distinguished audience. No one has had a twist and turns in their lives like you do. And you started as a journalist, a Neiman Fellow, a politician, president, Nobel Peace Prize. How did how all the shifts came about? And uh, <laughs> the Neiman had something to do with it? <laughs> well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. I'm, it's a great honor to be here. As I've been saying, 30 years ago I was here as an Neiman Fellow, and since then I've been repeating myself the best year of my life was uh, the <laughs> Neiman. Um, and uh, Margarita uh, asked me, what, what happened? What took you off uh, to do what I did on the peace process? And uh, the Neiman Fellowship had a lot to do with it. This story started 50 years ago, when I was in the Navy. I was a cadet, and uh, the officer gave me a sailboat with two other cadets and said, go uh, and sail. And we didn't know what to do, and uh, we jumped in, and the wind uh, really was a big problem. And then he said, uh, to learn how to sail, you have to have like in life, like in everything, a port of destiny. If you have a goal, then you can use the winds to get there. And then he taught me how to sail. That lesson has been very important in my life. And many years later, I was an Eman Fellow, and uh, I invited Howard Simon to Colombia. That was 1988, in the middle of the war. And he took a friend. A great man, Thomas Winship. He was a former editor for two decades of the Boston Globe. So here there was the former managing editor of the Washington Post, former editor of the Boston Globe in Colombia, and I invited them to a small house that we have about 70 miles from Bogota. It's a microclimate. And uh, they went there, and we went to sleep, Next morning, I woke up and I said, where are my old, my, my American friends? The person who was with us said, oh, they left about three hours ago. Uh, they went walking. Said, walking, yes. They were walking uh, in, in, a, in, the, in the forest, in the jungle. And, and I said, my God. <laughs> and uh, uh, I started w uh, waiting for them. It was about says eight in the morning, nine, 10, 11, and I was, my God, when am I going to tell the American people <laughs> that these two very important journalists had been kidnapped by, <laughs> by the guerrillas? And, and suddenly, they appeared. They were completely sunburned, but with a smile from ear to ear, big smile, both of them. Both of them were passionate bird watchers. Colombia is a country in the world that has the largest amount of species of birds, more than Brazil, Rosenthal. <laughs> uh, and uh, and they, they knew that. And that's why they accepted my invitation to go to Colombia. And they, they said, we had never, never seen so many birds in such a short period of time. And they brought out their cameras and their notebooks. But then, uh, Howard said, you know, this could be a paradise for bird watchers, but you will never have a, a, big, a large number because of your war. You must stop the war. That was 1988. <laughs> Three years later, I changed my profession. I went uh, to public office. I renounced my uh, status of journalist. Sometimes I say, I'm sorry I did that. <laughs> uh, but uh, I was uh, the first Minister of Foreign Trade. I had to open the economy. Um, and I went to New York. 
I remember very well with, there's a former bank, a chemical bank that organized a big conference. And we were in the middle of the conference. I went there to sell Colombia. We wanted to attract investors. And suddenly in the middle of the conference, we got news of a big, huge bomb in a commercial center in Bogota. Of course, the conference uh, collapsed. I mean, the, the, the idea of selling Colombia simply disappeared. And one of the, of the uh, CEOs of a big company that was present, he uh, came to me and said, uh, Minister, if you ever want to really have big investment in Colombia, you must stop the war. And since then, I started saying, we must stop the war. And I started studying all the peace process around the world. What, have, what could be applicable to Colombia and the peace process that we in Colombia had tried to make uh, that failed and learn the lessons from each process and that sort of uh, gave me a, an idea of what to do, how to go about uh, uh, seeking a process that could be successful. Uh, and I discovered a series of conditions that had to be created necessary conditions for a successful peace process. Um, for example, uh, you needed that the correlation of military forces was in the favor, uh, the upper hand was in the, in, in the hands of the state, that the commanders of the guerrillas personally had to be convinced that for them, in their personal lives, it would be better to seek peace than to continue war. You had to get the region to support the peace process. In today's world, any asymmetrical war, no matter where in the world, needs regional support uh, to be solved. Uh, uh, a conflict, an armed conflict needs regional support. That's why I had to make peace with uh, Chavez in Venezuela and uh, Correa in Ecuador and, and uh, with uh, Lula in Brazil. And we, we were the, like the black sheep and I had to convert that into completely the opposite of rallying support. And another very important condition was to recognize your, your adversary, your, your enemy. You have to dignify him, to bring him to the table in a dignified way. That was very difficult, but we did that. And those, those four conditions were necessary. They were implemented slowly but surely, and those were the basis for the, pro the process. Of course, the victims, the victims uh, became a crucial element in the process. And again, Harvard helped me in that. Uh, professor Hafitz, uh, professor of uh, the Kennedy School of Leadership, he went uh, at the very beginning of my presidency and uh, I met him many times before, but he said, President Santos, you're doing something which is going to be very difficult, extremely difficult. And uh, you're going to feel uh, disillusioned, um, willing to throw in the towel and simply, uh, simply go away and, and not to persevere. Whenever that happens, talk to the victims. Talk to the victims because they will re-energize you. And I did that as a matter of a discipline. I, I chose a certain moment in every week and I chose different victims that I invited them to my office to ask, and I asked them, tell me your, your story. Those were the most terrible dramas that, uh, that you heard, but then they all said at the, at the end, but President, you must persevere, you must continue. We don't want other people to suffer what I suffered. And that was extremely, extremely important. So I stopped there and... Uh, you were, you were an, uh, an unlikely leader of a peace process because you have been a defense minister of a very right-wing government. Uh, under uh, President Uribe, Ecuador had been bombed to kill a, a very important guerrilla commander. We had really bad uh, relationships with Venezuela that was a leftist government. And uh, you were a very strong and decisive minister of defense. How a very effective in terms of war, the Minister of Defense becomes the leader of a peace process that 
it was, as Rosenthal said, a mission impossible. Three times for 50 years, Colombia had uh, this war. They had three failed attempts, and each attempt brought even more, more violence. So how, how did it happen? Well, one of the conditions, as I said, was the military correlation of forces in favor of the state. And uh, I was a very uh, successful minister of defense uh, in, in the war against the FARC that uh, also had uh, to do with a strategic goal on, in the intelligence. Uh, I went uh, to seek uh, help with the British intelligence. I came to Washington to seek help with the American intelligence. They, they, uh, they helped me. And we started also to, to uh, strengthen the military um, uh, armed forces. Uh, but that was a necessary condition to bring the FARC to the table and have a successful negotiation. And the switch was something that people did not understand. And it was very hard politically. Because I got elected uh, as a, a successful hawk. I was the most successful minister of, of defense. I uh, had a series of uh, high value targets, all of them. Uh, we either uh, arrested or killed. And uh, uh, when I said, now, when I got uh, elected, I said, now we're going to go to, to a peace process, people did not understand. They started calling me a traitor, that I had been elected to eliminate every single guerrilla, which was impossible. And when I said, no, I, now it's the, the moment to sit down and uh, started a peace process. People did not understand. It was very difficult for them, me to explain to them that, was, that the way to end the war was through a peace process. And I remember very well uh, one of our, the international advisors that helped me in the process, uh, his name is Shlomo Benami. He was a former minister of foreign affairs of Israel, one of the architects of the Camp David Agreement, who said to me, uh, President Santos, you can continue the war. You, you were elected with the highest number of votes in the Colombian history, and you have more than 80% favorability in the polls. You can con continue for the rest of your government and maintain that popularity. Or you can start a peace process, lose all your political capital, even maybe your life, like happened to Rabin and to Sadat. Uh, but that is the only way you will end the war. And so I decided to follow his advice of uh, going to the difficult path, and that's how we end the war. Just a little bit of context. So the peace process was four years, and uh, President Santos called for a referendum uh, for the Colombian people to say yes or no, talking about binaries, where we just talked to one of the professors. And how can someone lose a plebiscite on peace or a referendum on peace? Have you heard of fake news? <laughs> <laughs> That's too easy. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a big blow. Um, I never thought, I had promised, when I started the process, many people were were afraid and they said, no, Santos is going to give the country away to the communists, to the Venezuelans, to, and uh, there was a lot of criticism because I switched from being a hawk to being a dove. And uh, one of the steps I took was to promise the Colombian people that I would, at the end, put the agreement to a referendum. Um, and that's what I did at the very end. Everybody advised me against it. Uh, two weeks before the Brexit had happened, and uh, the Constitutional Court offered me a, a way out, and I said, no, no, this is a promise I have to keep. And uh, I was quite confident because all the polls showed that the, the yes was going to win by a large margin. Unfortunately, uh, Hurricane Matthew appeared and 
touched Colombia. Colombia usually is not touched by hurricanes, but this time the whole of the north of Colombia, the same day of the referendum, was, was uh, uh, really flooded by the Matthews. So we lost about four million votes of the, of the north of Colombia, which were, ve were very favorable to me. Mm -hmm. But basically the, the no vote was, was induced by a very successful campaign of fake news, um, saying that uh, the agreement uh, will uh, end the military and that the, the new policemen would be the FARC guerrillas and that we're going to take the uh, money from, from pensions to subsidize the guerrilla movements and all kinds of fake news, and, and we, we lost. By a by tiny margin, less than one and a half percent, but we lost. And uh, I said to myself, we've been negotiating for six years. We had already signed the peace agreement. This is a, a war that has costed more than eight and a half million victims. Uh, the largest, uh, the, the longest war in the uh, American hemisphere with the most powerful guerrilla. I can't uh, really simply uh, have this uh, disappear. So I said, uh, let's try to find a way to strengthen the agreement. I uh, asked the, the, the leaders of the no vote, okay, why don't we sit down? What are your objections? So you can't be against peace. You said you want a peace, but you have another peace. And so I got a list of their objections. And then I negotiated with the FARC, I renegotiated with the FARC in Cuba, and we were like a double negotiations, and we were able to incorporate about 95% of the suggestions that the no vote had tabled. And we then uh, presented the new agreement to Congress, which was the way, the, the, the way that I should have done since the beginning, because I was not obliged to put the agreement to a referendum. And the uh, Congress approved it by a huge majority, and then we had, a, at the end, a better agreement, a stronger agreement, and uh, of course, uh, uh, I still am accused of, of uh, betraying uh, the, the democratic uh, uh, rules by not abiding by the, by the uh, uh, referendum, but the Constitutional Court gave me that option and I took it. I thought peace was much more important than anything else. When you, uh, <laughs> when you think back, uh, there are many lessons to learn. Um, I was always a stroke, but how poor for a president that has been a journalist, the communications of the peace process were. Uh, among the lessons, is that one of the lessons you have or? Definitely, yes. When you, when you look back and say, what went wrong? Uh, the information, the communication. But what happened? Um, the peace, a peace process uh, is like uh, a, an artist painting a, uh, his work of art. The artist doesn't want the people to see the work of art when it's 25 or 50%, it's when it's complete. We had, all, we had established a procedure, which is very, very common, that nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. And we decided to apply that in our information to the, to the press. Uh, we will not inform about the peace process until we have an agreement, because if you analyze the different uh, segments of the peace process by themselves, they were, they were going to be very unpopular. Oh, you're, you're giving the guerrillas a, a, a legal benefit, a judiciary benefit, or you're, you're giving them a space in the Congress. Um, it was much better to wait to have all the package and then say, this is the cost of peace and this is the benefit of peace. And as usual, the benefits of peace is going to be much bigger than the cost of peace. Well, that did not work out because uh, then the opponents of the peace process started to 
fill in the vacuum. And they started saying, oh, Santos is selling the country. He uh, has already sacrificed uh, private property. Uh, the uh, industries are going to be nationalized. The, and the fake news again, and the people started to get very um, nervous. So we had to, to um, undo our policy and decided to start informing uh, almost on a daily basis what was happening. And when you inform on a daily basis what is happening, uh, you get a lot of uh, different interpretations because you only get a part of what the whole package is. So that was a big cost for the process. Um, and at the very end, when we had all the package uh, ready, well, the, the perception of the people, of many people, were, was different from what the final package was. So we had to start doing a, a, a campaign of explaining the peace process, and that took time, and, and we still today are in that process. But that was a major challenge. I think this is one of the most difficult challenges of any peace process. No peace process in the world has been uh, uh, successful in their communications uh, because the worst thing you can do is to try to stop the information going out or uh, even worse is uh, try to censure some kind of, of information. So it's a cost that you have to live with in any peace process. Um, I cover this for many years, for almost five years now, and uh, you said several times that you had to had like a skin of a crocodile because it was incredibly hard, the opposition and what you were doing against the country that had lived with war for so long that seems like the normal way of living. Uh, can you elaborate on that? Well, yes, uh, uh, you have to have <laughs> a thick skin because <laughs> because it's, it's difficult. Uh, uh, for example, I decided to follow what I call the Rabin doctrine. Rabin, when he sat down with Arafat, he said, I will sit down with Arafat to negotiate a peace process as if there is no terrorism in Israel or in the Middle East. But I will fight terrorism as if there is no peace process. Uh, I decided to apply that same doctrine in the peace process. So I talk with my uh, adversaries, my enemies, uh, as if there is no peace process, but I continue the war as if there is, uh, I mean, I, I talk to them as if there is no war, but I continue the war as if there is no peace process. Separate the two. This is very difficult. And uh, for example, uh, one of the many uh, difficult situations was uh, a massacre that the FARC, the guerrillas, committed in, in the south of the country. They, they uh, killed about 16 soldiers and wounded another 30. And the country was really in, uh, in an uproar. The, and my, my sons and my wife uh, said, you can't continue this. Uh, you have to stop. And uh, I said, no, I have to continue because it's exactly what I want to stop is these things repeating themselves more and more. And uh, you, have to, you have to persevere. And I told my kids and I told my wife and I told the Colombian people, no, no, on the contrary, the rules were made by me. And these are, this is what war is. This is what we have to end and uh, to explain that is very difficult. And to receive the criticism on a daily basis is very difficult. But when you're absolutely clear of what you want, when you have this port of destiny quite clear, then you have to continue no matter what happens. And my polls, of course, came down terribly. And uh, I remember the, the, the both great leaders, uh, Churchill and Abraham Lincoln, at some time in their lives said, you must do what is correct, not what is popular. And I persevered. Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, at this, I mean, that history would uh, 
recognized you as sometimes I feel like Mikhail Gorbachev is so widely recognized internationally and uh, and in his own country not so much do you think maybe that's something that could happen to you you're just recently uh, I mean just recently re left the presidency so we don't know but well I don't want to compare myself to Gorbachev who <laughs> did the great thing <laughs> But, but uh, no, no, I think, I think the people are understanding that it's better to live in peace than to live in war. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, in a month and a half, my polls have gone up tremendously. So, <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> so I, I, I am so quite we'll, happy. We'll see. <laughs> but, but yes, uh, uh, these type of processes, you, you, you need to allow things to so settle down. Um, the... the uh, Peace process in Northern Ireland, for example. I don't know how many of you have seen the movie called The Voyage. It's a conversation between the two leaders, the two sides, and at the very end, and this is a true story, they, they said to each other, do you understand that our people, your people and my people, will say that we are traitors, but the world will applaud us? That happened to Mandela also. Uh, President Clinton sent me a book about his, his speeches, and he, he underlined what he told, an anecdote that he told uh, that Mandela called him once and said, uh, President Clinton, they are really uh, tearing me apart. They're, they're criticizing me a lot. And he said, who, the people, the, 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 the people who are leaders of the upper side? No, no, my own people. I said, this is a cost of the peace process. So uh, this happens everywhere. Uh, in El Salvador it happened, in Guatemala it happened, in Sri Lanka it happened. But then afterwards people realize that what you did is the best possible solution. I mean, any peace process is not a perfect peace process. Any peace process you have to, you have to decide where to draw the line between peace and justice. Uh, always there are people who would like more peace or others who would like more justice. So there will always be people who are not satisfied. But in the long run, it's much better. And logic and the classic people say it's much better to have peace than to have war. Seems obvious, but <laughs> not for Colombia. Um, can you tell this audience what's the status now of the of the peace agreement? They, the, there's a new government and the uh, right the right wing party, the extreme right wing party, is now in power. They have been in power for a couple months. And do you feel anguish about what it's going to happen with that legacy? Well, a bit, but not too much. Why? We were very careful in in trying to make this process irreversible. And fortunately, we were, in a way, able to do that. Uh, the constitu the, our constitutional court, which is the highest court, and it will not be changed in the next four years, said that uh, when, they, when they accepted the peace process uh, and they gave their blessing to the peace process, said for the next three presidential periods, there cannot be any law or any reform that goes against the implementation of the agreement. Second, this peace process is uh, very sui generis. Um, usually the peace processes are limited to what they call the DDR. It's uh, demobilization, disarmament, and reintegration of the insurgency into civil and political life. That part, the DDR, has already been accomplished. They gave up their arms to the United Nations, they demobilized, and they are now uh, reintegrated into civil life and into political life. We gave them five seats in the Senate, five seats in the House of Representatives, and they are, right now, uh, be, being politicians. You can, you can summarize the peace process in a photograph that was published uh, this year uh, in the uh, elections. The commander of the FARC, 
for the first time, went to vote in his life, never voted before, alone, disarmed, as a member and leader of a political party. So that was the, changed the bullets for the votes. Now, we added two very original things in this peace process. One is, it's the first peace process that is negotiated under the umbrella of what is called the Statute, the Statute of Rome. This is an international agreement uh, uh, which was negotiated to facilitate the resolution of armed conflicts. No other agreement has been negotiated under the umbrella of the Statute of Rome. We decided to do that. Uh, and so we brought in the International Penal Court. Uh, we approached the process with a human rights approach and at the same time the, uh, the Constitution of Colombia had to be taken into account. All these elements are present and uh, we had gave ourselves 15 years to, uh, to implement the transitional justice. It's a special court that has already been formed. It's already working. And so there will be no impunity with war crimes and crimes against humanity. They, the, re, more, mac, the most responsible of these crimes will be judged, sanctioned, and condemned. Uh, so this is a, a, a very unique peace process where two sides negotiate a special transitional justice system and accept to, uh, to be judged by the system. And at the same time, we negotiated development plans, 15 years development plans, 16 development plans for the areas that were more affected by the conflict. For 50 years, many areas, the state simply did not go there because we, we couldn't go there. And they, they are very rich areas that are completely abandoned. So we have 16 development plans drawn up by the community to be implemented in the next 16 years. This is the big challenge. Now, the new government uh, started saying that they're going to tear the, 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 the peace agreement uh, apart. Then they realized that this is impossible legally and politically. The people, people will not accept going back. Uh, nobody can imagine the far going back to the mountain and, and continue the war. They can sabotage part of the implementation of the development plans. But again, the people of those regions are claiming, no, no, we want those money. We want that development to come to our regions. So that's why I say this peace process is irreversible. And what we're seeing in this two months is that the government has realized that there's uh, no way that they can change what has been agreed. Mm -hmm. And um, there are at least two big problems. Uh, some of the dissidents are, or some, I mean, some of the guerrillas are going back into the, into units or into the jungle again. Uh, they, at the beginning was 10%, now the last uh, statistic is 18%. And we're again full of coca leaves, which has been the, the fuel for the war. How do you see those challenges for Colombia? Well, the, the drug issue, uh, is a very important issue that is very uh, related to the, to the war and to the peace process. Um, I, I forced the FARC to accept as one of the items of the agenda their relationship with the drug trafficking. They didn't want to accept it they, because they have always said, we are not drug traffickers, we tax drug traffickers, that's how we finance the war. But they protected the, the coca cultivations, and I said, no, you must, you must accept not only that you will, will cut all the links to the drug trafficking, but you will help the, uh, the peasants to substitute illegal crops for legal crops. It was a very difficult negotiation, uh, but finally we agreed that. And uh, we started implementing that. Um, the, the FARC are helping 
in the regions that they used to control, this substitution of, of, of illegal crops for legal crops, but they, something happened in the last two and a half, three years. When we started talking about that, uh, the people said, oh, there are going to be benefits for people who have uh, coca plantations. So the coca plantations uh, increased tremendously. Uh, there was a perverse uh, 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 stimulus. You know? But then we said, OK, uh, we need to have a structural uh, solution because uh, we have been spraying the coca uh, uh, plants for 30 years with the help of the U.S. and uh, you spray it and the uh, day after they're replanted with a more productivity. So it's like a static bicycle. You, you, you uh, do all kinds of efforts but you don't progress. And that has happened in Colombia for the last 35 to 40 years. We have been the number one exporter of cocaine to the world markets, and we have lost our best uh, leaders, our best uh, judges, our best policemen, uh, our and best we still and best our best journalists, and we still are number one. The only way we can solve that problem is to give the peasants an alternative, and the way to give the peasants an alternative is to go and to the areas where the coca is, is uh, grown and give them an alternative. And that we, cannot, we could, could not do before because of the war. Now we're doing it. And this year, 2018, uh, already 55,000 hectares have been withdrawn voluntarily and replaced by legal, legal, uh, um, legal crops. And at the same time, we are forcefully eradicating another 70,000. That's 120,000 for this year. And we have about 200,000 uh, hectares in coca. So in one year, we will be able to uh, decrease more than 50% of the coca production, but on a permanent basis, not uh, on a very uh, short-term basis as we did before. Uh, and I hope that the government will continue to support this process uh, because it's the only way. At the same time, we need to continue to, uh, to uh, stimulate the discussion worldwide, but because 45 years ago in the United Nations, the war against drugs was declared. And uh, 45 years later, the war on drugs has not been won by the world. And uh, we still have a, a, the same or even a, a larger uh, problem with drug trafficking in the world. And one country, Colombia, cannot uh, solve the problem. This has to be a multilateral problem. Um, I am sorry that Samantha Powers uh, left. Uh, I wanted to thank her for her kind words and tell her we miss her. The world misses her. Uh, the world misses uh, the approach, for example, that Obama had with the drug issue. Uh, it's a practical approach, a pragmatic approach. Uh, the, the purely punitive approach has failed. We have tried it. It doesn't work. And so we need a much more pragmatic approach for the drug trafficking. And that's what we have to continue to discuss with the rest of the world. Uh, and uh, the United States, as a main consumer of drugs, has to be present in that discussion, but also the other countries, the Europeans and the other countries that produce the drugs. Uh, just last question to, and then we'll, he'll take like a couple of questions. Um, what there's a wave of nationalism, populism, despotism in the world. Uh, now you're a, not, not only a former president but a Nobel Peace Prize. What is your take on all this that is happening in the world? It's very worrisome. It's very worrisome because the extremes are taking over. The center, the what you call liberal democracy is, is weakening um, and uh, the technology in a way has, is helping uh, the process. Uh, you know this better than I do, you're all journalists, uh, how the, the uh, social media in, 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 in certain ways re-emphasizes the, 
the, the extreme. So you, you hear your followers are the ones who, who, who think like you do, and then you're energized by that. And, and uh, so there, there is a, a process of polarization in almost every country in the world. And uh, the big challenge today is to see if we can, the, the, the law of the pendulum, if we can again re-energize the center, re-energize a more pragmatic uh, type of politics. Pol politics have always been uh, a exercise of, of uh, negotiation. It's not black or white. It's not a zero-sum game. It's uh, you, you win a bit, I win a bit. Unfortunately, the polarization has made politics a zero-sum game. And that makes the dialogue very, very difficult, more and more difficult. We need to reestablish this dialogue, to accept that other people think differently from what you think. Um, I'll tell you an example with the FARC. Uh, and this is a lesson that a general, a Colombian general, gave me. He said, when I started, treat, treat them not as your enemies, but as your adversaries. The word enemy means you have to annihilate them. You have to simply wipe them out. Your adversary, you have to simply beat him, but not kill him. They are human beings. That approach was for me extremely important. And I think in today's world, the polarization, you have to start thinking in those terms. Uh, we are one world. We are one race, the human mankind. Uh, and uh, if we understand that, then we can talk to each other and we can agree on things. Otherwise, if you continue polarizing, then uh, very important matters like climate change, for me it's the most important challenge that we have today as humanity, will simply not be able to, not, will not be able to, to have any, any, any success. The fight against climate change, what we're seeing is precisely that. The polarization is making those type of decisions more and more difficult and that's what we have to try to reverse and find a common ground. Common ground, finding common ground is absolutely essential for successful politics. They tell me there, there's no... That there's, they tell me here that there are no questions that I misunderstood or that there's no possible. So let, just one more question. Your mini veneer, or your, how, how, what did you bring with you to Colombia with, from your mini veneer? Well, uh, Rosenthal uh, <laughs> mentioned, uh, I, I came here, uh, recently married, and I had one whole year of honeymoon. <laughs> it was, I say, it was like a love story, but without that final, very, very <laughs> fa fatal final, but it was a love story, and I, I went back to Colombia, uh, re-energized, and really was the best year of my life, and, and, um, uh, journalism is something that I have in, in my blood. I was born with the smell of the ink of the newsprint. Uh, my father, my grandfather, 100 years in the, in the business, and uh, I miss uh, being a journalist. Um, it's much better to be in, in this side attacking than in the other side receiving. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, but but uh, again, it's, it was the best year, and uh, for the the demons that are that are here, the new ones, uh, it's like a sponge. You just receive and receive, and it's the best the best thing you can be uh, you can have in in your life. Uh, um, I I remember Howard. Uh, he was a great person, a uh, great man. Uh, the the anecdotes that he told us. Uh, during his years at the Washington Post, uh, um, his relationship with Ben Bradley and uh, Nixon, and uh, uh, fascinating uh, anecdotes that I'm sure all of you have in different parts of, of the world and different uh, parts of your experience. And 
Uh, I think one of the richest, uh, most fulfilling programs in the world is the Neiman Fellowship. Well, thank you. <laughs>